because they're commercially useful to us, they're commercially very important. What we know about even predation on other living bivalves which are not commercially important is much, much less. So mussels are things we feel we know a lot about, the same with scallops, scallops oysters, cockles. Uh, and this here is a sort of partial food web of all the things which are after a blue mussel. And as you see, there's a whole range of different predators that are going to be using a range of different predatory methods on that mussel. Those poor mussels are a useful source of energy with a relatively thin shell. And yet, with that battery of different predatory techniques attacking them, there isn't a one-size-fits-all kind of defensive adaptation that they can use. Um, and also, what I always find sort of rather, rather salutary lesson is, of course, we know a lot about Michaelis edulis. If we didn't, if we could come back as paleontologists in, I don't know, five, ten million years' time, and there were no such things as mussels around, we wouldn't know the half of this from what you could actually reconstruct from the fossil record. Um, so there we have it, a dangerous world, and perhaps not all we can see in the fossil record. But then we do see fossils which appear to have been subject to predation. And those are sort of mildly curious, quite fascinating things. It's always nice to have a fossil with a story. Uh, and Jean Vanier very kindly gave me the picture on the left to show in this talk, just to show that I'm not completely mollusk obsessed, um, of a priapulid worm from the Cambrian, which almost incontrovertibly appears to be showing that that priapulid worm was eating articulate brachiopods there in the posterior section of the gut. Uh, possibly slightly more controversially, we have in the top right corner an ammonite which is sort of very famously reported by Kaufman as being eaten by a mosasaur. Now, of course, there are other examples of that at the moment. Some people believe them, other people don't. Um, and then much, much more mundanely, in the bottom right-hand corner here, we have uh, a gastropod from the Red Crag in Suffolk, which appears to have been subject to peeling damage, probably by some kind of crab, but actually that, that gastropod has lived to fight another day. But that predator attempt is fossilised for us to look at. And in a sense, gastropods do that so frequently that they're hardly worth remarking on. Um, it's just a, a curious fossil, as I say, with a story. And yet, predation is actually really rather important to the individual, and therefore scaled up in evolutionary terms. The cost of predation is high. So that echinoid certainly didn't reproduce after it ended up in that position. Um, but interestingly, nor did that brachiopod. Now, that brachiopod is one that's got damaged, unfortunately, by me while I was collecting it, but it could have been a predator. Uh, it had some shell damage at the uh, foramen end, uh, and unthinkingly, I shoved it in a tank uh, with some starfish. Very, very rapidly, uh, a starfish was attracted to that effectively bleeding brachiopod, and within a couple of hours, it was completely clear of flesh, except for the loaf of four, and to try and put that old story to bed. The only thing that people, that, that predators don't like eating on a brachiopod is the loaf of four. They're perfectly happy with the mantle uh, and the muscle material. So even being damaged, even if the initial predator attempt doesn't kill you, then in a, in a wild, unkind sea, then something else will often come and finish the job off. So the cost to that individual is equally as high as for the urchin. In other cases, just as we saw on the previous slide, some organisms escape and get away. Some organisms are better at that than others, and gastropods quite often show this form of apertural damage, uh, which can be repaired. Now, that guy quite possibly did live to fight another day and reproduce in that respect, but it will have been at a cost. It will have cost that gastropod a certain amount of energy resources to rebuild its shell, and it may or may not have had a certain amount of tissue repair to undertake as well. Those resources are resources that it would have better been normally using on normal growth and reproduction. So there is a cost 
to predation, whether that predator is successful or not. Uh, and we often think about that in terms of evolution uh, and thinking about the importance of predation as a driving force, along with competition in evolution. And we have all sorts of rather nice stories. So we're all quite familiar with thinking about the evolution of hard parts at the beginning of Cambrian, and I know there are various explanations that you can give for that, but quite a popular one, and also I would suggest quite a plausible one, is this idea that skeletal hard parts might well be evolving in many groups as a form of defence. It's a nice story, it's a plausible story. Equally, even within single clades, we can actually start to think whether predation has been an important uh, driving force in their evolution. Uh, and many of you will be familiar with the Mesozoic Marine Revolution, uh, which is this idea championed by Gary Vermeer that during the Mesozoic and beyond, you have this increasing sort of crescendo of sophisticated predators and grazers all coming to the fore. And some organisms are going to be in, in, in the line of fire of this MMR. And one of the things that we've been arguing for many years is actually that bivalves in the Paleozoic are a tiny bit dull. They're not doing very, very exciting things. Get into the Mesozoic, and you suddenly and polyphyletically start picking up a lot of these rather advanced life habits, cementing very deep burrowing, boring, swimming, and also some rather extravagant morphologies appearing polyphyletically during the course of the Mesozoic, and most of those, at least you can make, and I know I'm a bit biased here, but you can make a plausible case that those are defensive adaptations. So we might argue that predation has been a great driving force in this adaptive radiation of the bivalves. But the sort of flip side of that is if there are MMR winners, then there are quite possibly MMR losers. Uh, and again, it's unproven, but you've got quite a plausible argument that some of these sort of other slow, low-budget prey items, the stalked crinoids and the, crino and the brachiopods, perhaps are losers in that MMR. They can't function so well in shallow sea communities where you have very active and sophisticated predators anymore. So those are all quite nice stories, and in their way, they sound quite plausible. But really, what we would like to be able to do would be actually to test those nice stories. Um, but actually, that's more problematic than it might seem. First and foremost, we have to battle with what you people are all battling with as paleontologists, which is the vagaries of preservation. And in that case, I'm not worrying so much even just about my individual samples necessarily, but actually loss of a huge number of different predator-prey systems from a potential fossil record. I, I tried to point that out in the very first slide with the mussel, that most of those predators attacking that mussel leave no trace that we could happily recognise in fossil material. Uh, I'm just here to sort of help run that point home. This is uh, one of my starfish on, on a tank, feeding on a limpet. Those of you who are close enough can see the mouth of the, of the starfish and can actually see that it's already digested a fair amount of that limpet. When that limpet is finally digested, then it falls to the bottom of the tank as any other limpet you've ever seen. The extra oil feeding asteroids we know in modern communities are a huge, huge threat to a loss of different prey taxa, but we can't recognise their passage in the fossil record from trace fossil remains. So we have a huge problem. We are stuck with looking at just a relatively few types of predation if we want to try and chart and try and quantify it. And then we have the additional problems is we really have to have enough data to capture spatial and the temporal variability that we might be looking for. Um, and to put it bluntly at the bottom of the slide, single sites, however interesting they may be, um, don't help us very much. Paul remarked earlier that there was a sort of cottage industry, he didn't use that phrase but I'm using it, of people looking at drill holes in various taxa from various sites. 
in a sense, they're very interesting, but in a way, they're not really testing anything that we might want to test if we're interested in these rather grand stories that I highlighted before. Um, so let's look at one of those single sites, and just to show that, that you know, I do it too. Um, so this is a large cardite bivalve thing called Venercor um, from the London Clay, so from the Eocene. Uh, and this is work that I did with John Todd uh, about five or so years ago. And we were looking at a large bulk sample, uh, 260 odd valves of this cardite bivalve. And amongst them, there were 40 with these really very distinctive holes in them. Really quite small holes, not quite like a gastropod holes. And they had this unerring ability to sink themselves, as you see, very, very high p-value problems here, of going into uh, the posterior adductor muscle. Um, now, John and I are a bit perhaps like chain spotters, and so we, we recognised what was causing those holes. Um, those holes are drilled by octopus, not to feed through in the way that gastropods feed through their drill holes, but to inject a toxin which goes into the adductor muscle, allows the bivalve to gape, and then the octopus can feed through the gape. So that's a highly sophisticated predator method. But what does it tell us? In a sense, not very much at all. It tells us that there were octopus in the London clay seas, at least at a place called Nursling. Um, and in a sense, that's really quite exciting because octopus body fossils are very, very few and far between. But then with my slightly cynical hat on, I decide that actually I'd be perhaps quite surprised if there hadn't been octopus in that sea. But at least I can see them and I can see some of their activity. And it's that some that's quite important. So you can look at these numbers, 40 out of 267, that's nearly 15%. Um, but it doesn't actually mean that octopus were responsible for just 15% of these cardited mortalities. Octopus only drill at the top end of prey sizes that they are attacking. They do it as a last resort. Their other means of eating leave no signs at all. And actually, even within this fauna, we didn't actually find any other prey taxa which had drill holes in. So we're getting only a very, very sort of narrow view of what octopus were eating in this sea at Nursling. In a way, it's quite nice, though, because I'm always quite interested in behaviour, and the fossil record doesn't always help us very much in that respect, but it does at least give us a marker that, at least by the Eocene, octopus were able to use this really very sophisticated predatory method. And in a sense, it would be quite interesting to know at what stage octopus produce this amazing precision to locate from the outside of the shell where the posterior adductor muscle might be. So it's interesting, and we were certainly very happy to see it and very happy to publish a paper on it, but it's not really helping us very much understand the importance of predation in any broader sense. So what I want to do now is just look, uh, in the remainder of this talk, at two sort of different case studies that I've been involved with um, which are at least aiming perhaps to cast the net perhaps slightly broader with slightly more specimens, with slightly different questions. So one of them will be to investigate drilling predation over a mass extinction event. And another one is quite unashamedly looking at only modern material but trying to establish a baseline for the amount of crushing predation that goes on, in this case on brachiopod prey in modern oceans. So, looking at that first one first, before we start talking about mass extinctions, I just want to trot through a couple of slides about drilling predation. Uh, as Paul said, there are a lot of studies now on drilling predation, so it may be that I'm, I'm teaching people to suck eggs here. Um, here we are again in the red crag, uh, looking in the bottom corner here at a Leticia gastropod, which has this very, very clear um, borehole, which is probably drilled by a conspecific. Uh, they tend to cannibalise one another, uh, as well as eating other prey. And the nice thing about, about drill holes, just as we saw with the octopus, is that the drill hole gives you a pretty good impression 
or the ability to collect data on how they select and where they're selected to drill their prey. But the other interesting thing about natissids is that the diameter of the drill hole that they produce is proportional to the size of the predator that drilled it. So that then lets you then explore other aspects of predator-prey behaviour that we know are quite important in modern seas. So here I've got a, a graph showing the prey length, so the length of the gastropods with drill holes as against the size of the drill hole that perforates them. And you can see here you've got this really quite, quite jolly, um, significant relationship between size of drill hole and size of prey. So there's good evidence here that these red crab natissids are behaving just like their modern uh, analogues. They are selecting prey to larger predators are selecting larger prey with better yields. But again, you know, this is, this is the red crag, it's the Pleistocene, Pleistocene. It's not a huge shock to know that natissids are, are doing that. Uh, and the other thing I should say, that kind of relationship works really well when you have only one predator drilling holes at any one time. When you have a fauna, when there are several taxa of either natissids or muricids playing this game, they obviously all have their own sort of size relationships. And that kind of graph goes a bit skew with at that stage. So it works quite well for the red crag where there is apparently at that stage anyway only one natissid playing that game. So that's one thing though, we can look at behaviour quite well with your holes. The other thing is we can look at success rate in predation uh, in the very sort of simplistic way in a sense in that some drill holes get through, they perforate the shell entirely and those are successful instances of predation. Others don't manage it and yes we know there are the odd occasion when people can show that unsuccessful drill holes actually ultimately do lead to a successful predation attempt but those are few and far between and actually in honesty mostly acquired in tax. So actually we have got this really quite good metric of looking at successful and unsuccessful predation. Uh, and you can calculate prey effectiveness, which is simply uh, the proportion of incomplete drill holes over drill hole attempts. Now, why is that important? Well, that's important because failure is really, in a sense, what is driving any evolution that happens because of predation. If you have no failure, then you are never going to get any adaptations, whether they be morphological or behavioural. You have to get some individuals slipping through the net. So actually, it's a useful thing to be able to look at in an evolutionary context to be able to look at prey effectiveness. So, moving on to the question that I had at hand, which is to think about mass extinctions. Now, as part of his uh, sort of thesis, on escalation and predation pressure, um, Vermey suggested that mass extinctions should remove all the highly escalated prey species from a system. Uh, and that would be particularly true if your mass extinction involved some kind of food chain collapse. So what he's saying is expensive prey strategies don't work in a post-extinction world. So the prediction of that might be that we could try and test that in the fossil record, that predators should be more successful in recovery faunas than they are in the pre-extinction fauna. And in particular, for drillers, that might mean a lower prey effectiveness using that metric of looking at incomplete and complete drill holes. Um, so that's what this game is all about. Now, there has been previous studies looking at this idea of the maze um, by Tricia Kelly and Tor Hansen, and they've worked up here in the Gulf states of the US looking both at the KPG mass extinction but then at some of the subsequent ones. Uh, and what they see are cycles of escalation in prey species mediated by the mass extinction events. But importantly, they've, they've failed to support the idea that you get this loss of well-defended prey uh, at the mass extinctions. Um, now, it, they have a large study. They have a study with, from lots of different localities. That's how they've managed to stitch their time frame together. One can have feelings about whether that's a good idea or not. 
Um, but it's all done on the Gulf states. Uh, and as I said earlier, you know, one size doesn't fit all. Just because that's happening in part of North America doesn't mean to say that's happening everywhere. So we're going to move instead down here to the, the Southern Ocean, to the, what, what is now the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula, and see how we fare down there. Um, so this is the Antarctic, as you know, and we're going to look at Seymour Island, which is located just off the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, and I've been doing this work um, with Alastair Crane of the Antarctic Survey, but also a past student of mine, Caroline Soggart. And loosely speaking, we're, we're hiding underneath Alastair Crane and Jane Francis's paleopolar um, project on this. The Seymour Island section is fantastic. It's a well-expanded section with the KPG actually lying within one of the formations within the Lopez del Bartolano formation here. I've never been, but I know a man who has, and actually the exposure isn't bad, is it? Um, there are huge collections now, very, very well localised collections of material across the KPG boundary, uh, both at the British Antarctic Survey in Leeds, but I've also been out to the PRI in Ithaca and looked at the Zinsmeister's collections. Uh, and there were students from Leeds in the, in the audience here. There were several PhD students at Leeds actually looking at other aspects of change that goes on over this boundary with this fantastic material from Seymour Island. So looking at the collections that I've had to play with, I've been looking at predatory drill holes. These are the only fossils I've looked at for a very long while, so you have to enjoy these while we're here. Um, I've looked at thousands of specimens now, uh, and you get these really very clear, so they're comp you know, these, these are very uncontroversial predatory drill holes. Um, and you get them throughout the section uh, in, in reasonably large numbers. Um, so in all, I have 480 drill holes in my data set to play with. That's good. That's, that's as good as Trisha Kelly, etc., can handle from the Gulf states from several different localities stapled together. So I feel quite happy about that. But one of the things, actually, as I go on, is just to think about it. 480 is quite good, but actually when you start to try and do things, actually separate them into different taxa, then those numbers tumble and tumble and tumble. Um, and you have to start wondering about when that is acceptable. So we think we know who's doing it. It's this guy called Vanicaropsis, uh, which is a Natissi-like gastropod. It's about the only option that there could possibly be, and it has the right sort of stratigraphic duration to fit with the drill holes we find with it. Um, so a lot of drill holes, we could potentially play a lot of games, and this is the sort of shopping list of things that you might want to do with them. The top thing is frequency, and uh, as Paul said, there are a lot of people looking at drill holes out there, and looking at the frequency of drilling predation is something that people do as a sort of stock trade. Um, I've opted not to do that with this material for two reasons. One is it's beautifully preserved. You can get fantastic microstructures out of these mollusks. So it's beautifully preserved in some respects, but actually there are whole chunks of other specimens Missing, So that makes me feel slightly uneasy about deciding that I can see all the drill holes that there might be. But actually, much more importantly, I'm a lot more worried because I'm looking at it over a mass extinction event. Uh, and again, Gary Vermey pointed out very, very sensibly in the 80s that if you look at modern faunas trying to look at drilling frequencies, then you have a problem because if you look at... Um, populations of shells where you have also a crushing predator at work, then actually what you tend to do is exaggerate the importance of the drillers because when you come to count the number of drilled as against undrilled shells in your sample, you have a very, very reduced number of undrilled shells because of the activities of the crushers. Now, on a case-by-case -case basis, you can, you can take that or leave it and make your own decision at any particular site about whether that's important or not. But when you come to going over a mass extinction, when you know that certain crushing groups disappear, and you also know that new crushing groups radiate, then I think I'd rather not get involved with actually calculating that, that kind of metric. But the other things I'm happy to do, I'm happy to look at place selection behaviour and looking at the effectiveness. 
So this is just a, 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 another picture of some of the clay that we've got out of here. They're by and large all either sessile or very sluggish, shallow burrows on a, on a soft bottom. Some of them, these oysters, and maybe the rochidae worm are living, if you like, sort of semi-informally. Um, but these are the kind of characters that are being eaten. Uh, and this in part is what I mean about watching the numbers tumble, because although I start off with 480 uh, drill holes in my sample, if I decide I'm actually only going to look at prey taxa which have more than 10 drill holes in, then actually the numbers start to reduce. But what we can see pre-extinction is that this is a really very Catholic prey predator. It's choosing a whole wide diversity of prey. I'm not happy about talking about that as prey preference because we know the seafloor is really very, very patchy and we know that these individual taxa are going to have very different preservation potentials. So I'm not happy about pushing the ball out that far. But what we can see is that some of the things which are uh, obviously enjoyed quite a lot, these trigonal bivalves and the rochidae worms, at least go, we know, regionally extinct at that time. So it's not a great surprise that when we move over to the recovery fauna that we have lost those entirely. They weren't there to be eaten. But actually, you know, there are... There are there's other taxa in the recovery fauna which are drilled, but not in such large numbers that I would like them to play with their data. And in fact, as you see here, there is only one taxa which appears pre-extinction and post-extinction, which is this very, very large alleged cockle-like thing here called Lahilia larsenii. So that's the only thing, really, that I can use to address the questions I had. And then if you look at the numbers there, then my 480 has disappeared uh, embarrassingly. But I can do various things with them. Um, so you can look at prey size relations, and in a sense I'm sort of underselling this slightly, because I know about the size of the drill holes in other prey, both before and after the extinction. And what we see is that these very, very large bivalves are being attacked by the very largest drillers. Um, but as you see here, the recovery and the post, well, I've got the wrong around, the pre-extinction recovery um, data um, are indistinguishable. And we can see in both of those, and again, I'm not going to bore you with the individual data, but the, this predator knows what it's doing. It's predominantly attacking the dorsal posterior quadrant of these bivalves. And it's, it's only the bigger ones which are going for it. So this is, this is an experienced predator, and actually the mass extinction doesn't bother it in the least. What we can look at, that, though, is prey effectiveness, looking at this metric and looking at the number of incomplete boreholes over the total number of attempts. And again, actually, you're really only interested in the data on this side. But actually, I put this one on as well. This is the ammonite zone... Um, if you like, the penultimate ammonite zone before the extinction. Lots of different prey being eaten. As I say, it's a very Catholic predator. Um, but look at the prey effectiveness. And it's trying, trying to do home the point you have to compare like with like. Not surprisingly, prey effectiveness is a very taxon-specific measure. So that this thing here, dozy, it's like a miserable white burrowing bivalve of the kind of thing that these things are. It has an effectiveness of zero. Okay, so if something starts to drill it, it finishes the job. Compare that to uh, the Pitmidonte, the oyster, you've got a one in two chance of surviving that if a driller comes up to you. So huge difference in prey effectiveness, and you, you just can't pick and choose what, what you compare. But what I can do then is look at Lahilia last night, which occurs both above and below the mass extinction event. And actually, our, our hypothesis we wanted to test was actually, or the prediction was that actually the effectiveness would reduce after the mass extinction. Well, it certainly hasn't done that. It's gone up, although obviously not significantly so. Um, so that's the prey effectiveness. So we can, we can have a summary here. We had something that looked really promising. We have a, a hypothesis that people talk about, so it's worth probably testing. We have what looks like a single predator, and as I said before, that doesn't muddy, you know, that, that, that's good because it doesn't muddy the water. We're trying to look at the signal for several of them. 
And we've got evidence that in the Cretaceous, we've got a very Catholic predator showing, and I haven't been able to show you the data here just because of time, but showing really good evidence of stereotypic handling and size selection. These guys know what they're doing. Um, go across that mass extinction, and you've got a less diverse prey menu. It's a mass extinction. That's what happens. But actually, the predators are behaving perfectly normally, even though I concentrate on looking at the same species on either side of the extinction. If you decide to be a bit broader and say, OK, I'll look at arcoid bivalves before and after the extinction event, you can see that they know what they're doing with an arcoid bivalve. Their strategy and handling is not changing. And importantly, there's no sign that the prey loses any effectiveness over the KPG boundary. So my summary would be that this is business as usual, but with the really important caveat that we are saying it's business as usual, uh, as usual at the KPG at this particular locality, and importantly, with this particular predator prey system that I boringly spent hours collecting lots and lots of data on. It's not telling us anything at all about crushing predators who alone knows what the starfish were doing over that boundary. So I think I'm just sounding like a sort of clanging bell here, but just the sort of need to pull back the horns from making very sweeping decisions uh, and suggestions about data. So the second case study, which I'm going to look at really very quickly, is, is, involves brachiopods. I've always been very interested in what's happened to the brachiopods, sort of bloody-mindedness, really, apart from anything else. Um, one of the things that we need to do, really, with any of these groups, if we're going to understand our fossil data, is actually to understand the variability of predation pressure and the so forth in the modern environment. Uh, so that's what this, this small section of the talk is, is going to be about. In modern marine communities as a whole, there are two really very well-established paradigms. Uh, one is that predation pressure increases as you go towards the tropics, and the other is that predation pressure decreases as you go down into the deep ocean. Those are really very well-known paradigms and, and very well accepted. Um, there is very little data that actually very directly supports that. Intuitively, you feel those must be true. Um, but actually, when you look at it, there's relatively little data. And there's certainly no data at all on brachiopods. And, and the reason there's no data on most of these things is that it's actually very difficult to acquire. So most of the work that gets done, forget brachiopods, on most marine organisms happens in the intertidal zone. But the intertidal zone is a funny place. It's not typical of the subtidal. There are lots of organisms who have very, very extreme adaptations so they can live in the intertidal zone. So we're seeing a funny fraction when we do work in the intertidal zone. And obviously, to state, you know, to state the obvious, you can't look at the intertidal zone very often, once or twice a day if you're lucky, and actually at a time which is really very unhelpful if you're looking at most, pred most predatory organisms because they've shut up shop because the tide has gone out. So actually the intertidal is, is it's where lots of people do their work, but it's not necessarily telling us very much about what's happening in the sea as a whole. Now, of course, there are ways around that. Uh, you can bring your organisms down into the aquarium, and heaven knows I've done enough of this kind of work. Um, it's very useful. You can do certain things in tanks, but you have to be careful about it. So things are not behaving in a typical way when you bring them into the aquarium. And in particular, in terms of thinking about things eating other things, then actually if you leave something in a tank long enough to starve, it will eat almost anything you give it. Um, so you need to be careful there. You can go out into the wild, okay? You can look with ROVs, you can send, this is Lloyd Peck that I've done much of my brachiopod work with, you can send him down below the water. If you're very desperate, you can jump into a sardine can like I did and go down into the deeper bits of the ocean. But again, it's actually, it's quite fun, but it's actually just like being in the intertidal zone, only worse, because you just don't have the capacity of collecting the kind of data or the amount of data that you would actually need to quantify what was happening. So you can make anecdotal observations. I've just seen a fish eat a crinoid. Excellent. But actually, I can't actually quantify that really in any good way at all. So that's a bit of a problem, but actually one of the things that Lloyd and I have been doing is looking at sh shell material from bulk samples to look for 
not production damage that has been fatal, because that's always very problematic, because actually you don't know when that damage occurred, but actually to look at repair on shelled organisms. And in a sense, that's a very paleontologically friendly approach, partly because zoologists don't think of doing that, because they don't think of looking at the shells in that way. But also it means that any data that we can collect from the modern environment can perhaps dovetail at some stage with data that we collect in the same way from fossils. So what Lloyd and I have done over a lot of years is look at 112 bulk samples of live collected brachiopods. That's really important because we know exactly where they come from. We don't have any of these spectres of time and space averaging that the paleontologist has to deal with. And these are big samples, so the average, the average is over 100 individuals. And again, it's a bit of a pain to look at nearly 13,000 brachiopods, but actually it's the kind of thing that for paleontologists becomes much more difficult just because of the fact that they're in sediment, they have to be cleaned. It's much easier to do this kind of thing on modern material. But here you see the locations of our sample points. Uh, and it's worth pointing out, so here's a brachiopod from Chile with uh, a rather nice repaired gash in it. 75% of our samples have some sign of damage or repair in them. And so again, to stress, these were collected live, so we're not looking at the dead. You might expect the dead populations at the same place to be shown even more. What does that data look like? Well, if you look at it against water depth, then you get, if you look at the top graph, an interesting sort of pattern, okay? And it fits the paradigm quite well. So you can see that this is repair frequency up the side, this is water depth. So in the very deeper parts where we've got bulk samples from, there's actually relatively little repair going on. As you get into the top few hundred metres of water, there's a huge variability. There are lots of, um, lots of samples where there is no repair at all, but equally there's a huge range up to a maximum where um, you get 0.7 as your repair frequency. So huge variability, but most of that variability is in the top 200 or so metres of depth. And again, it took me a long while to my shame to realise this, but actually, if you plot that data log log, then you actually retrieve actually a very nice straight line relationship between uh, water depth and repair frequency. And I think that's the first time that anybody's actually quantified what, what everybody always sort of knew was true. Uh, but if you're going to take this repair as predation damage, um, I can talk to, that, talk to you about that later if you need, um, but that seems to be a reasonable proposition. Uh, but we've got good evidence that repair frequency decreases as you go down into the oceans. But having looked at that, let's just say, OK, most of the, most of the data, most of the interesting data is in the top 200 metres. Let's have a look at that data Okay, so this data has got a lot of structure to it. So that's Antarctica, well, it's the north of the South, so you might think that's the South Pole. Antarctica's rather in the way, so you don't have any very high latitude data. But you've got this fantastic structure, okay? Very high variability in repair frequency in the mid latitudes. And we were lacking low latitude southern hemisphere sites, so we had to wander over into the north hemisphere as well. But actually, very, very low repair frequencies down here. Does that mean the paradigm has failed? Uh, and I would argue not. Um, but it's, it's an interesting amount of structure in this data. I'll explain why I think not in, in, in a second. Um, if you divide these data up into to analyse the differences between them in 30 degree bins, there is a highly significant difference between the repair frequencies that we see in these 30, 30 degree latitudinal bins. Even if you split it up into 10 degree latitudinal bins, most biologists would buy that as being a significant difference. Okay. So that's quite interesting, but what I really hoped from the paradigm is obviously that predation pressure would be going up and up and up. There's something gone wrong here. Does it mean the paradigm's wrong, or have we got an alternative explanation? Uh, and I think I have. Okay. So what we see down here is relatively low levels of repair frequencies in the Southern Ocean. 
Uh, and I'm not surprised by that because the Southern Ocean is famously um, pretty scant in Durophagus predators. There aren't many specialised predators down there. There aren't lots of crustaceans. There are some notophenia fish that we know eat the brachiopods, but there aren't many things down there eating shelled organisms. Um, here, in the mid-latitudes, where repair frequency is very, very high, is where you get big brachiopods. Okay. Brachiopods in Chile, which the, the length is about 10 centimetres long. Those, however, whatever you feel about the tissue content of a brachiopod, have a decent amount of protein for a predator to get at. It is no wonder that things are eating them in the mid-latitudes. What have it done here, though? The thing you need to notice, or we need to think about down here, is that the brachiopods in the tropics tend to be very, very small. Paul showed us earlier some, micromorph some micromorphic thecidians down there. But it's also true that the, the terabrachids and the lincolnellids in the tropics are, at the moment, are smaller uh, than they are elsewhere. Now, that might well mean well, it could mean two things. So we, I think the repair frequency is low because we're talking about just very, very small brachiopods down here. But that could mean that nothing's eating them because they're small. And they'll go and eat a bivalve instead. Um, but it could equally mean, and it suggests an interesting hypothesis now to go away and look at, that perhaps that micromorphing might be uh, an adaptation to the intense predation pressure that we were expecting at the tropics. Uh, and that's possibly a story for another day, but just to remind people that actually during the Jurassic, if you look at Somaliland uh, and other places through Arabia, um, look at Jurassic fossils of the right age, which are at the Paleo Equator at that stage, there are some very big terabrachids in those collections. So it's an interesting hypothesis that we could now start to chase that actually perhaps it's the MMR that forces this micromorphing of brachiopods. Um, but really, I just want to sort of almost leave you at this stage. So single sites don't do it. Okay? There's a lot of structure in this data. This is just the less than 200 metres data. You saw what it looked like from other water depths. How close would we ever get to actually seeing or thinking about the things we're thinking about here from single points? And how, you know, how wrong might we be in having sort of rather heated discussions about two separate samples drawn from this particular data set? So I think really I just want to leave you. I have no idea how long I've been going on for, but it's about time to stop, I think. Is what, do, what do we need from paleontology? There's some really enticing hypotheses, and it's really easy sort of back of beer mat stuff to say, oh, I reckon it was predation pressure did that. It would be really nice to be able to test these things, but really we need far more data. We need really to be looking at far more than just mollusks. Uh, I have my little foray into brachiopods, but there are lots of other things that we could be collecting more data. There's some data on crinoids, uh, there's a very small amount of data on corals. All of those would be good taxa to chase more predation data out of. But in big enough samples so that we can get a sense of variability. Um, and in a sense, we have to try and find a way of linking all these very small studies that report drill holes in X from some particular quarry in Y. And the more we can move away from North America and Western Europe, the better. Thank you. <laughs>